This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio, where each week we talk to a musician, artist, author, or other creative Mississippian working in the arts across the state. I'm your host, Melody Moody Thordis, Director of Grants at the Mississippi Arts Commission. On today's show, I'm speaking with Eric Schaessner, a Jackson-based musician who recently released a new album entitled Ocean Springs. Thanks so much for being here, Eric. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. Well, for our listeners who may not be as familiar, can you give us kind of an overview of how you define your style of music? Uh, sure. I A little bit, it depends on uh, the record and uh, the sort of cast of characters that's been in the room when I was making that record. Uh, but I would say I'm a, I'm a songwriter principally. And um, so, you know, what I do is write songs and then uh, when we can get into the studio and kind of interpret those and, uh, and make recordings of them. But, you know, what I would call myself is a singer songwriter, I guess. Uh, well, we're going to spend some time today talking about uh, your different albums and your experience as a musician, but let's kind of back up and I'm curious to ask you a little bit about some of your early experiences and influences. So you grew up in Mobile, is that right? That's right. Yep, I did. Uh, in in the heart of Mobile, kind of down uh, in the mid part of the city, uh, close to downtown. And I went to Murphy High School, which was the big uh, giant high school in that part of town. Um, and uh, the, the sort of connection to Mississippi was I uh, wound up going to Millsaps College here in Jackson in um, the early 80s. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, so that's kind of how I got to be a Mississippian by choice have said before about your father uh, playing music and records. Um, it, it, it's tell me a little bit about those kind of earliest memories. Sure, yeah. We, I mean, like a lot of families, uh, we had a piano in the house and um, uh, had to take piano lessons uh, and did not show any promise whatsoever at that, um, but my dad, played the guitar and I absolutely remember being um, around him while he was playing and he would make up kids songs for us and stuff like that. And he was, he was a good player. Um, really my little brother, Sam, um, my younger brother, I should say, in a way was kind of my first musical hero because he started a punk band when we were both in high school and they were actually really good. And I'm going to give a shout out to them. Their name was Johnny in the flesh. And um, I've actually had some people ask me years later, did you ever see that band in Mobile? And I said, yeah, my brother was the tall, good looking guitar player. So um, the fact that he learned how to play and then, you know, made it happen was out there playing I, I saw them in literally in the garage go from guys that couldn't play to this band that was really good and and that was exciting and I was jealous is the wrong word I, I think I was just really impressed and then um a guy who I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute Will Kimbrough is from Mobile and he, you know, as early as middle school was uh, winning the talent show at our middle school, uh, playing in a band when he was in eighth grade and I was in seventh grade. And, um, and so he was kind of a prodigious talent. Even in high school, he was making a living as a full-time musician. And, um, and, and I think this is really important, is writing really good songs. 
And so I think that, um, I, I just assume that every sort of medium sized Southern town had bands that good. And I don't think it's the case. I think Jackson did. Um, and I found that out when I moved here, but um, I don't think it's that common. And, um, and looking back, I think that was, both of those things were real critical for me. I, I mean, my brother was doing it and one of my best friends was not only playing in a band, but at this incredible level from the time he was a kid. Um, so, and, and you know, my family had records. We had this room that my mom called the study, which was, you know, it was so 70s. The walls had those grass mat, um, seagrass wallpaper. And I remember the way that room smells and that's where the record player was and all the records and um, no TV, nothing like that in there. And I totally remember um, saving up, buying records, and then playing them, or pilfering my parents. Yeah, I, I'll never forget, they had the Herb Albert record, and, you know, Miles Davis records, and I just thought the covers were incredible, so I'd listen to all that stuff, and I was just a sponge from early on. I really liked music more than, more than any other, I think, form of art. So you just got in there with the record collection and and started listening to different things or were you hearing that and you know I'm just curious cuz you know that you can you can stay at a at a turntable for hours and hours just looking at album covers and being curious yeah, I can and and uh you know that's one thing um that uh it, it's interesting the way folks consume music now and, and my best example are all my children who are almost grown. Uh, they're in college and my daughter is a senior in high school. And I'll ask them, they love, all four of them love music and they have really deep and different tastes. But I'll ask them, oh, that's a cool band. You know, that sounds great. Where are they from? And they have no clue. And, and they really don't care. You know, uh, it's more in a way it's pure because the music is just coming to them as music. Back then, in a way, the album cover was such a huge part of it. And if there were liner notes, that was very interesting or the inside sleeves were very interesting. And you could tell who played on the record and who produced it and all that stuff. Uh, um, you know, that was really cool to me. Uh, for instance, I remember listening to Elton John records when I was really little. I think Elton John's Greatest Hits might have been the first record that I saved up money and bought myself. Uh, and I was telling somebody in another interview not too long ago, I could have done a lot worse than that. that they were great songs. And, um, and, you know, it was cool to find out that somebody else wrote all those lyrics and then I I think it made me think well you know how do you write lyrics how do you make up a song uh and his songs were pretty um what's the word dramatic <laughs> and fantastical uh and um maybe cinematic too and I think I just remember sitting on a couch in that room and it was just music transports you and it sure did me <laughs> um that or tommy by the who you know the who were really uh huge for me and um it, you know i i guess i always thought about songs early on and i was just kind of uh focusing on uh songs and how they went and lyrics it was just I was going to say it was like magic the truth is it's, it's absolutely still like magic to me so as you were listening to these albums you're seeing your brother play what did you pick up first what did you when did you actually start playing not till a lot later um I think that I didn't think I could 
uh, because I was so impressed with, um, you know, like I said, Will Kimbrough's band or my brother. I, I just, I just assumed it was something that I couldn't do uh, was play the guitar or uh, play the piano or when I got to Millsaps, um, as you can imagine, there were a lot of guitars and a lot of dorm rooms. And my senior year, I, I wrote an honors paper and my junior and senior year, and that's a pretty big commitment uh, at that school, or at least it was back then. And um, so you have to spend a lot of time. And so uh, I, my roommate, at the time had a couple of guitars and I just started to basically to get rid of stress and to take a break. I would just grab a guitar and put on a record and start trying to play along to it. And lo and behold, um, I found that I didn't really have a, a great um, facility for playing quickly or anything like that. But what I did have was a pretty good ear and so I could figure out how songs went pretty quickly. And I, I remember somebody gave me an Elvis Costello songbook and a Beatles songbook. And they both use a lot of tricky chords, you know, compared to a lot of uh, songwriters. Um, and so I uh, uh, just did those things and put on records and just by trial and error started playing a little bit and that I mean I kind of stumbled into it to be honest with you thank god nobody was watching except for that one roommate um, so. so so you're essentially self-taught on the guitar I mean you just worked it up from there did you get instruction more instruction later or was it just a progression of learning no no none just uh, but then it's kind of like once I got a little bit and, and I think this is true of anybody who's trying to pick up an instrument once I got a, a little baseline knowledge then what I was watching people do at shows uh on stage and stuff started to make a little bit more sense and it's kind of like a uh a, a curtain fell or excuse me went out of the way uh, like a barrier got removed. It's probably like somebody learning conversational Spanish before they go to Spain. You don't know exactly what's going on, but and it was the 80s, so there were a lot of bands with big hair and <clears throat> you know MTV kind of stuff. And um, luckily, I wasn't around. <laughs> We didn't have MTV, we didn't have cable television in the dorms or in any of the apartments I lived in. So what we had was a lot of records and there were a lot of good bands um, back then that, um, you know, good bands and good artists that I was really soaking up at the time. A lot of which didn't have music that was very hard to play on the guitar, which was lucky. So, you know, I found out, I, oh, I could learn this song and and it wasn't that bad uh wasn't that hard so that was encouraging did you um did you play with anyone at Millsaps that you found yourself playing with later um in the Jackson area no I I, I wasn't good enough uh I mean and I was I was scared to um I mean I was really a beginner at age 22 like a rank beginner uh, there were a lot of people who were really good um, around. In fact, uh, I saw Flinghammer a couple of nights ago. My friend Matt uh, Brennan plays drums for them and uh, their guitar player, Morris Mitchell. I remember seeing him when I was a senior and he was a freshman and I was just learning how to play the guitar and I saw him in somebody's dorm room and he was just ripping already and I thought I'm never gonna play guitar around any of these guys they can all you know all these young guys were killing it already so I kind of uh 
uh, tried to do it in secret <laughs> for, <laughs> for a while. I didn't inflict myself on, on the general public for a little while. Hi, I'm Melody Moody Thordis, and you're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. To hear all our conversations with creative Mississippians, be sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast on your favorite podcasting app. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson. President of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. Each week on the Arts Hour, representatives from the Mississippi Arts Commission speak with different creative Mississippians. Today, I'm speaking with Eric Strasner. Eric was twice named Best Singer-Songwriter by the Jackson Free Press and is here with us today talking about his new album, Ocean Springs, and his creative journey in music. So Eric, um, I wanted to talk to you about your new album, of course, but I thought we might kind of start um, and talk about your four albums. So why don't you tell me a little bit about um, Sockeye, your first album uh, you released in 2003. And I'm curious, you know, that story of, of the very first album, I'm sure has some um, creative uh, stories behind it. So tell me about creating that and what that album means to you. Boy, it seems like a long time ago, um, and, and it was, but uh, I had uh, been in a couple of sort of punky style bands in the early 90s, and uh, we wrote a bunch of songs and had a lot of fun, but we never really recorded anything, um, and I'd been sort of a side guy in a really good band in Tuscaloosa, uh, a singer-songwriter named Jim Jones. Uh, and he was, I learned a lot listening to him and trying to write things with him. But I never really, you know, we didn't really make any records or anything like that. And, and then I went to law school in Oxford uh, in the mid nineties and, you know, I sold my Stratocaster <laughs> and, uh, my amp and, um, I had an acoustic guitar and a lot of homework, uh, to do and didn't really play much, but I was always trying to make up songs and trying to get better. And I was really playing a lot of acoustic guitar uh, and so I just started kind of stacking up some songs and at first you know predictably um, most of them were pretty pretty bad you know um, but I but I told myself I would finish them that they would never get better if I didn't finish even songs that I didn't think were very good and I got some good advice uh, actually from, uh, my friend Will on that. He said, just finish them. You know, nobody ever asked to hear him finish them. And, and that's, that's very good advice. Um, so anyway, I started stacking up some songs and then moved here. Uh, and, you know, I was a young lawyer working and, um, and that first record was being made. I had my little boy had just been born. And so, and my little girl was going to be born soon. It was a pretty busy time around that household. And so really about the only time I had to do anything like that was um, after uh, dinner and bath time and putting babies to bed. And Chris Nicholas, 
good friend here had a studio uh, in the in uh, the Fondren Corner Building upstairs. It was called Papaholic Studios, and it was uh, essentially that was just Chris. And so Chris was engineering and recording it, and I, I made a really great lifelong friend and sort of collaborator at the same time, a guy named Nielsen Hubbard. And Nielsen, uh, you know, had already been signed to a, a major label and gone on all these tours. He was a singer songwriter from here in Jackson and uh, had found himself back home. And so he was starting to want to produce people. And so Nielsen, was good enough to agree to produce that record. And essentially it was just me and Nielsen and Chris in these little increments of time. Uh, you know, I would go for two hours one night and then go for a couple hours the next week and um, a lot of trial and error. But, I, but, I, but one thing, I did have all the songs together and they were all kind of uh, arranged pretty well but um you know if we needed a drummer we'd pull somebody in uh i remember jonathan mclaren who was a really great uh songwriter himself played drums on a couple and um you know we just sort of pieced it together it was diy uh big time but i noticed that Nielsen's ideas were usually really good. Um, and I also noticed that I really liked making a record. That was really fun. And just the process of it was real fun. And then get them mastered, mixed and mastered. And then boxes show up with a bunch of CDs and at the time, I, I just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that um, this sort of do-it-yourself record got made. And my friend Tony DeFada did the cover art, which was really cool for me and for him. Um, and, you know, it was just, it was a hoot. And I didn't know if anybody would care or notice. And um, luckily, some folks did, and they were very kind. And, um, you know, the, the first one was just a blast. It, I, those are very, very good memories. Um, well, your next album came out in 2006, The Trick Back. Mm -hmm. right. And then you started playing as Eric Straisner and The Frustrations. Right. So, <laughs> so what, was, what was that? Was the, were the Frustrations people you put together, or were that, was that a band playing together already? No, it wasn't. It, it was sort of who we got together to make that record. And, and that record was recorded at a studio that was, amazing it's it's sadly it closed but sean mackey uh had the studio and um some some brilliant records got made there one of cassandra wilson's records got made there uh, i think the one that maybe won her first grammy um but anyway it was a professional incredible studio and so the idea was instead of taking six or eight months in tiny increments to make a record, we'd go in and get people playing uh, and live more or less and capture that and get a band together. And, you, you know, not, I didn't have a band. So it was kind of, uh, it was pretty interesting. And so uh, Denny Burks, the drummer for the Vamps and a lot of other people, amazing player, and a, a, one of my best friends, we well, knew who was going to play drums. Denny had agreed to do it. And um, I knew I was going to play acoustic guitar, maybe some electric guitar. Uh, John Hawkins uh, and I knew each other really well. And he was a great guitar player and bass player. And so figured, okay, well, John can play bass. Um, and... 
I, I remember I had written an article for our review for the Jackson Free Press um, for this band Buffalo Nickel, and who were great, by the way. They were just a killer band. And Steve Deaton was one of the people I think I interviewed for the record. And I said to Steve, well, would you mind coming in and maybe playing a little guitar on this record? And he said, sure. And he showed up and just blew us away. And so I sort of looked around and I thought, well, I think, I think we got a band here. And we, we did. I mean, it sort of clicked from the beginning. Um, and there were a few other people that came in and played parts. Barry Sullivan played some pedal steel. And Bob Pitsick played stand-up bass, if you know Bob from the Vance. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. But, uh, it, you know, it just sort of happened because we were playing live. We had to learn the parts, but everybody learned very quickly, and it kind of clicked. And so then all of a sudden I had a, you know, I, I didn't have, we had a rock band, which was after having nothing but an acoustic guitar for a long time, it was pretty fun for me. Do you feel um, like your sound changed um, dramatically from the first album to the second because of the acoustic kind of to the rock band that you're describing? Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and I loved it. Uh, the first record was kind of a solitary exercise. Um, and this was all about, you know, everybody's ideas pinging off of each other in real time and all the other guys writing their parts, you know, and, um, and that was real fun. Um, and we made that record quick, like three days, maybe oh. something like that. Uh, I think I had to come in and, overdub vocals on a fourth day maybe I think that's right um but the reason it took three days is because those guys were really good and um they're they were all very generous musically and they all their first ideas were usually really really great and so uh, like Steve is a great example you know, I had no idea. I knew he was a good guitar player. I kind of, at the time, thought of him principally as a singer and uh, sort of one of the front men for Buffalo Nickel, front people, because they had a front woman as well. Um, but he came in and just played blazing guitar. And I, and I remember when he was getting his case to go, I, I think I said something like, well, if someone ever asked you to just be a guitar player in a band what would you think about that and he said something clever like well someone ought to just ask me and I said okay I think that's what I'm doing and he said all right that sounds fine and and so then uh that record came out and we learned a bunch of songs and we played a lot of shows as that four piece and that was really fun so when we so we moved to your third album, Levy. I never quit making up songs. I I never quit playing the guitar a lot. Um, it just it just took a while, and and Levy is sort of back to the DIY method of putting a record together. We did these like guerrilla recording sessions. One, some of those songs were recorded in a, in a deli, in Steve's Deli downtown. Some of them were recorded at James Patterson and Ron Blaylock's old gallery. Um, some were recorded in uh, Kevin Cornell's studio. Uh, some bits and pieces were recorded at Denny Burke's studio he had at his house. So th the my hat goes off to Kevin Cornell for mixing that record because it's pretty hard to take a bunch of different um, recording sessions and make it sound like a record. And I, I think he did. I, I don't know how he did it without having a nervous breakdown, but he did. And, um, and so that's another reason that 
took so long to get a record out is I would do some stuff and then, you know, just get busy for a year. And um, like I said, there were a lot of changes going on and other stuff got more important, um, which is fine. Uh, but by the time we sort of had to grapple all that stuff together, I, I love those songs. And um, the folks playing on the record, again, did great. And it was some of the same people. Uh, Steve Deaton played a lot of guitar. Jimbo Harwell played on it and did some great arranging as well. He's a really, really great guitar player. Um, Danny Burks played the drums um, and uh, Will Kimbrough. That was the first time Will and I had ever recorded anything together. And so we were sending files back and forth as musicians can do now. It's not always a good thing, but when um, a guy who's really good lives in Nashville, it's okay to send files to him. And then we get back, you know, incredible parts and, and poor Kevin had to, had to weave all that together, uh, but he did. Um, and uh, he, he did a really good job of it. So that record, I, I, uh, I really like, and it's not like I have a memory of making it because making it occurred over the course of a decade, literally. I'm Melody Moody Thordis, and you're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. To hear all our conversations with creative Mississippians, be sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast on your favorite podcasting app. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You are listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Melody Moody Thordis, and today I'm speaking with singer-songwriter Eric Strasner. So Eric, before the break, we were talking a little bit about um, your um, past three albums. And now I want to talk about your new album, Ocean Springs. So tell me a little bit about um, the inspiration behind the title of the album. Sure. I, you know, uh, like I said, I grew up in Mobile and became aware at some point of Walter Anderson. My mom was uh, very interested in him. And I think uh, sort of exposed me to that whole world, which is to me, very fascinating. Um, he's probably my favorite artist. I, I don't know if that would be true if he weren't from next door to where I grew up, but I think so. I, I just think um, he and a lot of his family um, were just amazing and also uh, real interesting and um, you know, to me, flawed and complicated, uh, a, a complicated person. Um, and complicated people are interesting to write about. Um, and I miss the Gulf Coast sometimes being up here in Jackson. I miss uh, the water and uh, live oaks and just the way it looks and the way it feels in the wintertime. And, um, so I had never really written a group of songs with any kind of um, theme before, but this time I did. And um, maybe I was just homesick. 
Um, and I had started uh, dating my wife, Shelly. And so I, she lived in Pensacola and I was riding back and forth, you know, hugging the Gulf Coast for a lot of that drive a lot. And I just started thinking. I started playing a lot of shows down there too. And I just started having that on my mind and maybe being a little nostalgic and maybe a little homesick. And uh, so I guess Walter Anderson and Ocean Springs kind of became a, a subject for starting points for songs and um four or five of them are, are you know uh pretty much directly about that or about that locale and in fact on on the we made vinyl of this one and on one side of the vinyl it says you know the suite for the gulf coast or whatever um pretty pretentious but it was a little tongue-in-cheek but in, anyway it was um it was pretty intentional to do it that way to, I mean, I told myself, I'm going to write some songs about X and, and did it. And I'd never really done that. And I found it in a lot of ways a lot easier. So, um, and so that's what I did. And I made them up and wrote them up and uh, I really uh, need to say, this is somebody who, you're a fan of and a friend of, but um, I started playing all these songs uh, with Jamie Weems, and he was mostly playing mandolin, and he and I started playing some shows together, and that just clicked um, pretty instantly, and also, um, you know, he became a really good friend really quick he's just you know you know this but he's he's an incredible musician and a really good person um with a good family really great people and so that was just really comfortable and he very much helped kind of create how those songs were gonna be um i've been playing solo shows for a long time no longer band shows for several years and I, I think I was a little tired of it looking back because having Jamie play mandolin and guitar on some songs um just made it super fun and fresh and so I had these new songs and a new collaborator and so I just started popping them out and then uh the pandemic hit and it really started popping them out because <laughs> there, wasn't, there wasn't much to do. And so I get back to, you know, Will Kimbrough's advice. I started finishing everything. Uh, you know, I started looking back at all my notebooks and um, I keep all these little kind of moleskin journals with all these scribbly bits in them. And I record on my iPhone anything that I, on guitar that I think might be useful later. And I've started finishing and um so there we were in a pandemic didn't have any gigs jamie and i couldn't really play and so uh i started my idea for to record this one would be to uh do the opposite of what i'd done on levy um 12 years to make a record is not uh like a real efficient model. <laughs> so I, uh, I thought, well, let's don't do that. And um, so Nielsen Hubbard and Will Kimbrough live in Nashville. And I just said, look, let's get me on in the studio you want to use. I'll save up, I'll set aside some time and as soon as we all feel comfortable doing it from a pandemic safety standpoint, we'll book it. And so I booked it far enough in advance last summer. 
and by the way, I, I need to say that um, the studio is owned by uh, Dylan Aldridge, who's from the Mississippi coast. He's a young guy and his studio is great. It used to be Nielsen's and Nielsen passed it on to Dylan. And now Nielsen works there all the time and lots of good records get made there. And Nielsen works there all the time. Dylan obviously owns it and he's there every day. Will Kimbrough works there all the time. So the idea was, I'm gonna get you two guys and, and at the time, the plan was to have Jamie come too. And the four of us are going to be in a room for three days and we're just going to make a record. Bam, bam, bam. And I had in mind that it would be a uh, mostly acoustic record. Unfortunately, Jamie couldn't come and it was just, it, you know, it was one of those things where he had family obligations and he hated it and I hated it. And um, he will for sure play on the next one um but uh so he couldn't go so i went up there by myself and the three of us just made an entire record including background vocals everything we had three full days booked and we got finished at like 3 45 on the third day i couldn't believe it i mean we just those guys um that's what they do all day long and and it was very relaxed and I, I was real comfortable with the songs. They were real, I think they were real tight. The arrangements were really good uh, or at least how I wanted them to be. And then, you know, everybody's, like I said, when you're working with people that good, their first inclination almost always works their first idea so there's not a whole lot of redoing anything and we cut it just about live um you know nielsen would play drums and i'd play guitar and sing at the same time i think i did that on every song but maybe one um and will would play bass and then he would grab a guitar and do an overdub and then we'd say okay they would say what's next and i'd say okay guys this one goes like this and i would play it for them and then an hour later, literally, we'd be saying, okay, what's next? I mean, I couldn't believe it. I should believe it because they're incredibly talented guys. Um, and, and, you know, pros. Uh, people pay them to help them make records for a good reason. I'm just lucky because they're friends of mine, too. Um, so uh, we wrapped that thing up in three days and uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to put it or at least get it ordered to be on vinyl. And that took a long time because there's only so many, uh, there's only so many factories that press records anymore. And uh, so we got it done in three days. Well, it sounds like through our conversation, you know, we talked about Levy kind of being recorded all over Jackson and uh, kind of being a nod to that city. And then Ocean Springs really bringing back these memories and um, the coastal towns. And so my last question as we wrap up is what's next for you? What are you exper experimenting with? I know you're obviously, you know, promoting your album and, and doing that. I don't know how much you're being able to perform with COVID um, numbers, but, you know, I figure you're always working on something or think about something musically. So what's, what's Absolutely. Next? I'm always scheming. I, you know, it's funny. We, we had uh, our uh, album release party at Ron Blaylock's Gallery in Richland, which is a great venue, by the way. Everybody ought to, Ron is having music almost every week, and it's really a sweet place. And so me and Matthew McGee and Jamie played that to get, Jamie Weems played that together, and we worked up all the songs as a trio. It was really fun, and the turnout was amazing. It was great, huge success. And then I remember going home that night, you know, kind of exhausted and really happy and grateful everybody came out. And I was thinking, all right, 
so what the hell are you going to do now? And that's how I always think about it. Um, and, and there are four or five. Uh, one thing I'm always doing in my journal is writing titles. Like, and I think I'm up to about four or five songs that might be keepers. And when it gets to be about 10 or 12, that's when I start thinking, okay, it's time to get these recorded. And, you know, I mean, being able to make records is just something I'd never thought would be possible. And the act of making them is plenty reward. It's great. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners. So if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org.